Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Daily Highlights program that uh, will be supported by the Asian Pacific Society of uh, Cardiology. My name is uh, Dr. KK Yeo from Singapore and uh, with me today um, is uh, Dr. Arin Taya from Thailand and Professor K.W. Park from uh, South Korea. So today we're going to uh, discuss a little bit around one of the debates on um, the role of imaging in primary prevention. And I think we're going to start with uh, Dr. Arin Taya giving a bit of a brief overview of what was discussed, uh, I think, by uh, an earlier session and discussing around that session. And then we can have a discussion on um, what, what we think would be relevant within the Asia Pacific um, uh, area. Uh, over to you, Dr. Arin Taya. Hi, everyone. It is my honor to share with you today the, on the highlight of the great debate on lipid lowering therapies. Uh, this debate is presented in the first uh, day of conference by Professor Steph Stephen Nichols and Professor Colin Bajan, and then uh, summary by Professor Martha Gulati. This is a great debate on lipid lowering therapies should be guided by vascular imaging rather than plasma biomarkers. I would like to a summary of the key of the key message that presented by two presenters. Both of the presenters uh, agree on this. Uh, message. The message is the significant role of cholesterol in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, as we all know and uh, uh, agree on this, and also the benefits of cholesterol lowering treatments uh, in cardiovascular risk uh, reduction, especially using statin. <clears throat> By uh, presenting this uh, data from cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration, which show that the benefit of lipid lowering uh, agents is uh, shown regardless of base like LDL cholesterol, whether you have uh, LDL cholesterol less than two millimole per liter or more than 3.5 millimole per liter, statin versus placebo or, or high potency statin versus less potency statin, it shows the benefit of uh, LDL reduction in every milli one millimole, millimole uh, per liter LDL reduction will reduce the cardiovascular events in about 20 to 30%. In addition to the cardiovascular events, the benefit of LDL cholesterol reduction is seen on the plaque progression. It shows that the lower LDL uh, or the higher LDL reduction, you can lower the plaque volume even more with the uh, LDL reduction. However, the, the point that the, they were debated on is how to select the patient to treatment. The debating is on the imaging biomarkers versus plasma biomarkers. We all know that uh, we have several types of biomarkers imaging, uh, from Cori imaging or uh, aortic imaging versus plasma biomarkers. In this uh, debate, they use a standard clinical risk estimation from con conventional blood tests. Therefore, the, uh, the evidence supporting vascular imaging was selected from this data. The data from Professor Verma presented, uh, uh, published in Jack 2022 showed that the higher calcium core artery calcium score is associated with lower uh, accumulative survival or even free survival. And with more um, a higher number of core artery involvement, you have greater risk of cardiovascular events. Therefore, calcium score is associated with cardiovascular risk. And also, the, uh, Professor Nichols presented the data from Scott Hart in patients with chest pain. The, the benefit of core CTA guided therapy is shown. Uh, and uh, the cardiovascular events in CTA guided therapy is lower than the standard care. That shows that uh, vascular imaging might be. The, the, way, the better way to go for uh, guiding therapy in lipid lowering therapy. And even more than uh, benefit, it shows that if we image the patient and show the patient about the outer side imaging, carry the outer side imaging, let the patient know about the results of the outer side, the patient can be more adherent to lifestyle and pharmacological therapy. And from this study, it shows that with higher adherence to treatment, the patient risk score using Framingham risk score or score in patients who know that imaging results will be better 
than the patient who don't know their imaging results. It shows that using vascular imaging can assure the patient to get better adherence to, cardi uh, to cardiovascular intervention, to uh, lifestyle therapy or pharmacological therapy, and that may improve risk of cardiovascular event. That is the, the information that uh, supporting using vascular imaging as a, a guide to treatment for cholesterol leveling therapy. That's uh, the supporting of the vascular imaging core arteries calcium score associated with cardiovascular event. Core CTA guided therapy improved outcomes and vascular imaging increased adherence to treatment. I would for some reason uh, show the data that may, may use as arguments against core artery calcium testing. He preferred to use conventional uh, serum biomarkers and conventional cardiovascular risk stratification. He presented this, this data that from a uh, MESA study, the patient with unknown core heart disease with risk estimation to be either low risk estimation, intermediate risk estimation, or high risk estimation, using a core artery calcium score might significantly improve in clinical risk prediction with net reclassification improvement of 0 0.25, which shows statistically significant. But the, uh, the, the gains are modest, particularly if statins should be given on widely used in intermediate risk group anyway, because the significant improvement is shown in intermediate group. And uh, Professor Bayan also emphasized on this uh, cumulative effect of LDL cholesterol on risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We might appreciate that uh, we have, assume, presumably we have a threshold to develop atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we have, if we have a higher LDL, very high from the beginning, we, at the age of 20, we may reach the threshold to develop atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And about 10 years later, we may, we may reach the threshold to develop cardiovascular events. But if we have lower LDL, such as LDL cholesterol of 80 milligrams per deciliter, we will have longer time to uh, the threshold to develop cardiovascular disease and longer time to develop cardiovascular events. So this is his argument that against core artery calcium testing, because uh, using a core artery calcium score testing may, may significantly improve net reclassification index in patients with intermediate risk for cardiovascular events. However, the, the net risk reclassification index is modest. And this data show is, is not cost effective to use core artery calcium score testing. And using core artery calcium score testing, as we all know that it might develop in the later age, like a, more than 50 years old, it does not address clear priority in cardiovascular disease prevention. If you want to uh, emphasize on early atherosclerotic process to prevent development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so overall, on the great debate of lipid lowering therapies, we learned that both of the presenters emphasize on lipid lowering therapy in primary and secondary prevention. The lower LDL cholesterol, the better cardiovascular outcomes. We should use high potassium statin for secondary pre prevention. And for primary prevention, cardiovascular risk-guided treatment uh, and assessment and uh, using that as a guideline for primary prevention should be considered. And uh, we will be discuss whether that's uh, the applications in ASPC community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Arintaya. So I think you've nicely summarized the uh, key points of discussion uh, during the great debate. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the arguments are quite convincing in of themselves, except when you consider them in totality. I, I don't know, um, KW, uh, would you, what would your comments be? Do you, do you see this uh, as an issue um, in, in Korea? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think this is a very interesting topic because uh, conventionally, uh, we treat uh, all of our patients based on their LDL levels. And the, the conventional guidelines are mostly based on uh, the LDL levels. Uh, I think the problem is 
uh, with the development of the more imaging, the better imaging techniques recently, uh, and the recent adaptation of these techniques into our clinical practice. So for example, in Korea, a lot of patients receive uh, uh, health checkup programs. And it, within the health checkup programs, the coronary calcium score is uh, almost uh, included in, uh, in their checkups. So basically we have the knowledge to a lot of these data. Uh, even uh, further, a lot of these patients receive CT angiograms that actually uh, show plaques in their coronary arteries. So what are we gonna do with these data? Uh, do we rely just on uh, the biomarkers, the LDL cholesterol levels or LP little a, or do we uh, use the additional information from the imaging and to uh, use that in a way to improve the outcome uh, for our patients? So I think the debate is not whether you use imaging only versus you use a biomarker only. I think the debate is how are we going to integrate the additional information we get from uh, the imaging techniques that we have. Uh, and I think regarding secondary prevention, uh, you know, imaging does not have that much of, an uh, of a role because once the patient has an MI or has a PCI, you want to get the LDL cholesterol levels as low in, uh, as possible, and, uh, and you will just continue forever. Um, I think it is regarding the primary prevention patients and when to start statin therapy uh, where this becomes an issue. Uh, and so I think uh, there is compelling evidence. There is, the compelling evidence is building um, to support that we need to think about integrating imaging data uh, into our clinical practice to select the patients that we choose for primary prevention. Thank, thanks very much, KW. Um, Arin Taya, so what about you? In Thailand, would you, you know, because what we hear from KW is that it adds information, patients go for screening, they come back with a calcium score, it helps him, it helps the doctor make a decision. Um, what, what is it like in Thailand? In Thailand, uh, the use of core artery calcium score is not widely available yet. And we did not use it in routine checkup. And, and but but my idea, I think that uh, even even we use standard conventional uh, uh, checkup on plasma lipid and cholesterol uh, on or blood sugar, we still don't use that data uh, enough for risk stratification of and on prescribing primary prevention therapy. Therefore, I think we should emphasize on using that. Uh, conventional or standard uh, risk estimation and um, on biomarkers rather than uh, adding core artery calcium. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we have this session at APSC is because uh, I think within Asia, we have a very broad and diverse population um, across different uh, socioeconomic strata. And I think the discussion that uh, Professor Park and Dr. Arintaya have highlighted in, uh, highlights some of these uh, conundrums. So in Singapore, we, we suffer from the same problem. Um, do we routinely recommend calcium scores for all our patients? Uh, how do we screen? And uh, for some of our, what we call captured cohorts, uh, the soldiers, for example, should we recommend calcium score as a, uh, a way to risk profile patients? But if we do so, then there is a substantial cost implication for our patients. Now, I want to say that the cost implication doesn't just refer to the CT scans, but the downward, the downstream effects as well. So you, you do a CT scan, you pick up a little spot in the lung, a little bit of a nodule in the lung, and you know, there's a whole spiral of uh, tests that follow. So uh, we struggle with that. Now, in the audience, we have a member who would like to make a comment. Uh, maybe you can go to the mic at the side and uh, have to hear your thoughts on this. Could you introduce yourself, please, as well? Uh, my name is Jorge Trejo. I work at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. We see quite a number of patients that have Southeast Pacific origin, and we see significant amount of metabolic disease that uh, increases the risk beyond the traditional lipid markers. So that my concern is that there is, I think, a consensus that we have to be early in the modification of risk factors. And that is the conundrum because early we don't have the imaging markers that are traditionally associated with identification. Coronary calcium use 
usually appears in the late 40s, 50s. And my guess is, especially in, in the Southeastern Pacific Ocean, I mean, uh, populations, what else can we use as a plus by biomarker to early identify? For example, my, my guess is if we use hemoglobin A1C, as has been seen as to be an early adjunctive predictor of early atherosclerosis in the Spanish cohorts but led by Dr. Fuster, I don't know if this information has been gathered in your populations in, in the Pacific Ocean. If, if there's a sort of um, development of long-term prediction like the 30-year Framingham risk prediction score that has been well validated in Caucasian populations, but I don't know if it has been validated in, uh, in, in your population so that we can have an early identification. Because as I said, imaging doesn't seem to add much in the early identification of this population. And, and that's my guess, I guess, the consensus that we should be really addressing. No, I, I think that's a very valid comment and I agree with you fully. Um, the, the one problem is, um, so uh, e even the ACC and AHA guidelines recognize that the Southeast Asians have a higher risk uh, of um, coronary disease, um, you know, relatively compared to other ethnic groups. So they try to emphasize that uh, the guidelines should be uh, uh, interpreted uh, in the context of your population. Uh, and so, uh, we may try to be more aggressive with primary prevention in the Southeast Asia population. Uh, as you mentioned, I, I don't know of any studies that have validated something like the Framingham score for a long-term prognosis uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, trying to differentiate the, the true high-risk patients. And also, it's also true that the, vas the, the vascular imaging studies, especially the calcium score studies, uh, are only become apparent at a much later stage than in the earlier stage. So I think, um, I feel personally uh, that uh, in a population that has, uh, as a population, a higher risk group, we need to try to uh, develop more clinical scores uh, to find the patients that will benefit from an early uh, onset of treatment of uh, statins. However, uh, if you look at Korea and Japan patients, it's completely different than the Southeast Asian patients. So we have less coronary disease, and this is also recognized by the ACC and AHA. They say uh, if versus the Southeast Asians, uh, the, the, the East Asia, the Korea and Jap Japanese patients are less likely to have coronary disease uh, with the same features. So um, as a population, the risk is lower. And what happens is we see a lot of patients that have LDL um, 120, 130, 140, you know, in their mid 40s, they have one or two risks, risk factors. According to the current guidelines, they all need to be on a moderate or greater statin. However, if you do uh, a coronary CT angiogram in these patients, they have absolutely no plaque at all. And, and some of these patients have a lot of side effects to statins. And that's where the, the, the you know, dilemma comes in where they keep coming back to us and asking, do I really need this statin? Um, and I feel that uh, uh, in these patients, if you can do a coronary calcium uh, score and get a zero score uh, and, you know, or a CT angiogram, uh, and there's no plaque at all uh, in the coronaries, uh, why would you put them on a statin and, and risk the, the side effects? Um, but I think this is an area where we need uh, further data uh, regarding uh, what would be a good way to risk uh, stratify these patients. In terms of catching these patients at a very early stage, I think it needs to be more clinical. Um, but uh, there, I, I feel that there is an added role of, uh, of uh, the imaging techniques because it is becoming so uh, uh, easily available in certain parts of the world. Uh, thanks, uh, KW. I think the points uh, made, I, I, sorry, I didn't catch your name, um, is... It's a good one. Uh, just a quick, and maybe I, I'm not right here, but uh, there are Southeast Asians, folks from Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore. There are folks from South Asia, uh, India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, and then there are the East Asians. Um, but, you know, for many of our countries, we have a strong history of uh, migration. So a country like Singapore has both East Asians, South, you know, Southeast Asians and South Asians. 
And of course, the question is how much does genetics, how much does culture, how much does uh, economics play in the uh, milieu of uh, atherosclerotic development? It's complex. Now, to the question of uh, early identification, um, imaging will help, but imaging cannot reach, say, the masses that we have in, say, Indonesia or Thailand. It won't. But if we have the information um, in a developed country like uh, in Korea, then I think it does help. Uh, so having understanding the nuances, I think, uh, help inform us as to treatment choices. I think some other biomarkers that have been uh, you know, looked at, uh, CR, high sensitivity CRP, and I think there are others in the works, may also inform us, but this would have to be contextualized to the population because we don't want to, how do I put it, over-investigate. It does add substantially to the nation's healthcare budget. Ar Arintai, what do you think? Uh, I do agree that uh, from from ethnic point of view, it's uh, different be, uh, between uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia and uh, East Asia. However, the, the different significant difference is the metabolic profile anyway. So I think that uh, biomarker, serum biomarker, and risk stratification can be used. However, in the young population though, who did not develop a significant metabolic derangement yet. We do need um, some biomarkers to help to establish like a probably a fibroblast factor in the future that uh, significantly associated with metabolic syndrome and metabolic derangement that may be able to predict uh, the risk in the young population who did not have a significant derangement of metabolic profile such as blood sugar or lipid yet. Uh, and I think one of the questions can also be, um, you know, is, is coronary calcium score the optimal imaging technique, which is probably not. Uh, I mean, it's because it's readily available that we use coronary calcium score. Um, but um, in my opinion, so Korea has a very sort of a unique system where uh, the health checkup system is very, very developed. So uh, a significant portion of the population uh, are supported by their individual companies that they work for. So they support uh, uh, you know, health checkups yearly. And what happens is a lot of these patients re receive, you know, one year they will receive a low dose CT to detect lung masses. Another year they will receive a CT angiogram to, to detect coronary uh, uh, atherosclerosis. And what happens is, um, you know, you see in some patients that have uh, very high calcium scores, but actually if you do a CT angiogram, you know, of course, because of the blurring ar artifacts, sometimes it is not uh, definite, but you can see that they only have uh, not so severe disease and a lot of the calcium is sort of uh, outside in the adventitia and not, not in, in, in the intima. Um, and in these patients, uh, the calcium score is, it shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, it can't really identify the, the true high risk patients. And in certain other patients, uh, you feel clinically they are low risk, but then they have a significant disease uh, in the coronary. So, you know, um, as coronary CT angiograms become more available, oh, will this be a good substitute? There was one study that uh, our, uh, Dr. Arantaya just presented that, that showed uh, a CT angiogram uh, gives more information. But you know, as CT angiograms become more apparent, um, as we do more carotid uh, you know, uh, uh, ultrasound, uh, can we use these estimate, uh, these uh, imaging techniques um, uh, instead of coronary calcium scores? Because uh, true, we, the guidelines address the coronary calcium scores, but I think the reason they do is because that's probably the only uh, met, uh, methodology that's readily available uh, currently. Uh, thanks very much, KW. So I, I think the, probably the jury is still out, huh? I mean, there's a role to play for imaging, but there's also a, re, a role to play for um, using risk scores. And as Arin Tai put out, there's so much we can do to help our patients. We don't you know, we can control their sugars, we can control their blood pressure, we can stop smoking, we should tackle perhaps the low-hanging fruit. So there are these uh, aspects as well. I wonder whether we should switch our tech a little bit to talk a little bit about two trials that was discussed yesterday and this morning, and uh, maybe how it applies to our populations within Asia. Uh, and I'm talking, of course, of uh, Revive and uh, Invicta. So KW, you and I are, inter are you international cardiologists? I can't remember. Okay, so two of us here are interventional cardiologists and Revive 2 came out yesterday, I said in the, 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 the thing uh, in the presentation and just to, just to remind everyone, Revive showed that uh, for patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF of less than 35%, 
uh, PCI uh, did not appear to have any significant benefit over uh, optimal medical therapy in reducing uh, composite outcomes, including uh, heart failure and, uh, and uh, mortality. So, so KW, as an interventional cardiologist, do you think that affects your practice in Korea? Yeah, so this is a, a, a little bit counterintuitive for interventionists like myself. Um, we feel that as long as there is um, active ischemia and the patient has reduced uh, ejection fraction, that we would think that by revascularizing uh, these uh, arteries, that the patient will have uh, uh, clinical benefit, uh, then that was just not seen uh, uh, yesterday in the, in the tri trial main results. I think we will have to wait for more details from the trials. Uh, uh, I'm sure they're uh, currently doing a lot of the sub-analyses from the, the trials, but it was actually a, a bit surprising that uh, patients uh, uh, with reduced EF uh, and uh, demonstrated um, uh, you know, uh, ischemia uh, did not benefit from uh, PCI. But if you look at the bigger picture, I think it's, it's uh, sort of in line with the ischemia trial and, uh, and a lot of the other trials that have showed that uh, uh, you know, good adherence to guideline-directed medical therapy uh, may be just as good as, uh, um, uh, as uh, PCI. Uh, as an interventionist, however, uh, I don't know if you know, this is going to tr change my practice completely from tomorrow. Because still, uh, I mean, if you see a patient that has reduced EF and you see significant, uh, 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 you know, perfusion defect on a, uh, on a myocardial spec, uh, and the patient is also symptomatic, uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to just say, you know, based on the results of the trial that you should be just kept on medical therapy. So I don't know about you, Kate. Uh, thanks, KWI. I, I'm going to ask Arin Saya, as a non-interventional cardiologist, will you refer a patient for revascularization? EF is 35%, coronary artery disease. Would you send for revascularization based on the uh, revived study results? Uh, no. I, I I'll tell my piece, uh, interventionist colleague that uh, save your energy for primary PCI and non me <laughs> and uh, leave us with uh, this kind of patient for medical therapy. I think for me, such is such as a relief for me because I do got a postulated hypothesis that in 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 the stitches time, stitches and, and stitch and stitches, the benefit of core artery bypass grafting is not related to LV ejection infection change. So I, in my uh, idea, I, may, I thought that um, the benefit of core artery bypass grafting may be from the reducing of myocardial infarction. And in a PCI, we cannot reduce MI in this group of in these patients. Therefore, in my thought, that's why um, using PCI in coronary artery disease in ischemic cardiopathy then that show benefit on reducing cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Personally, I in my routine practice, I don't quite um, refer them to interventional cardiologists unless I, they have refractory angina or the, the, the symptoms that may relate to ischemia in that episode. Thanks. Uh, I think that's a tough one, isn't it? So when we saw the headline results um, yesterday, I think there was standing room only in the Barcelona room. Um, and I was like, great. You know? And then, of course, my phone keeps ringing and everybody says that PCI is dead, long live PCI. So, you know, but, but here's, here are some thoughts. Uh, the first is that um, the trial is a really challenging one. It took eight years to run. Uh, 700 patients, and um, there was definitely a crossover for patients who needed urgent revascularization. How would that play out in the results? Hard to be sure. Uh, but my main concern is that um, is truly were all patients, could patients, could doctors not refer the patients for the trial? Meaning if I were uh, enrolling patients for the study and somebody had a proximal LED 80%, 85%, um, if an EF and uh, you know, viable LED territory in the apex, EF of 35%, would I, in good conscience, enroll the patient for the trial? I must say I would be hard-pressed to do so, not to do PCI. I say, you know, don't worry, you're taking part in the trial. You know, uh, if something happens, just call the ambulance. So number one, I, I worry a bit about enrollment. I think that's the same problem that people saw in the ischemia trial. However, be that as it may, um, I think it makes me less willing to push people to do PCI if they don't want to, you know, if they're not keen to do PCI, because I know that 
there's a backbone of literature that supports optimal medical therapy. As long as patients understand that if they have uh, escalating angina symptoms, unstable angina symptoms, they should then call the ambulance. Now, um, I think we will need to wait for more data uh, in terms of the angiographic uh, characteristics, uh, you know, uh, the, the details of uh, imaging uh, before we can uh, uh, glean more. Um, th there is a member of the audience. Maybe we hear from him first. You want to go ahead. Uh, again, my name is Jorge Trejo, and I was uh, from AO Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. I was a PI for the ischemia trial, so I have a bias. And uh, I, I, I'm also a trialist, and, and precisely that's why we conduct clinical trials. And we all have a vested interest, of course. I'm a non-interventionalist, and I have a bias, obviously, to treat first with optimal medical therapy. But I think... Based on previous, I think we have to follow again the, the Bayes theorem, and we have to judge in, in view of the previous evidence that we have. And if I remember well, even the, the surgical trials for heart failure patients didn't show a, a, a very good benefit, even just for the management of um, congestive heart failure in, in a very sub, specific subgroup, so benefit. So I'm not really that surprised that with all the advance in medical therapy, we're seeing less benefit of having an intervention and a, you know, a significant uh, improvement on the overall uh, cardio maze outcomes. I wouldn't be surprised either that even though it's a very small sub uh, group of patients compared to the ischemia trial, only 700 patients, maybe there's going to be some trend in the management of symptoms. I, I wonder in the subsequent analysis, they're going to be showing some benefit. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised. And I would still be doing that if the patient is not having an improvement in symptoms. So obviously, I'm going to send him. But again, I think, as, as you were mentioning, we should be less, and I have that bias again, we should be less pushed to, to, to do an initial management of intervention right from the bat. I think yeah. this gives us a little bit of time to say, okay, let's, let's hope yeah. that patients also, because patients are, are also our main pushers too. They want to have something done. And we, we, as, as clinicians, we also feel constrained and say, okay, oh, let's do something. But I think this, this is great evidence that yeah. sh should give us pause and say, okay, why don't we try to put all we have gained painfully over the last decade or two in terms of lipid lowering, improving of heart failure management, which has been great. I mean, we, we're just uh, scratching the surface of SGL2 inhibitor therapy, uh, uh, GLP-1 analog inhibitor therapy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that let's just give it a try, yeah, I would yeah. say. No, no, I, I think that's exactly right. And before KW uh, shares his thoughts on, on your comments, you know, I, I was just going to say that uh, this Tuesday, before I flew into Barcelona, I had a patient with an LED and FFR of 0.74, but really it doesn't look that bad and had no symptoms, you know, and then I thought about courage and ischemia. And when I say, you know what, I spoke to the patient and said, you know, I don't really want to PCI you because I would stent you from LED to distal LED. And even though your FFR is abnormal, let's give medical therapy a try. So I think this is very reassuring. Uh, for all of us in the community to say that we don't always have to hammer the nail when we see it. KW, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, uh, I guess a lot of the results are uh, very humbling as an interventional cardiologist, um, um, seeing that, um, you know, we sometimes have this oculostenotic reflex where we look at an angiogram, we forget everything about the patient's symptoms or the clinical presentation, and we just make sure that we make, we we were sort of like plastic surgeons where we have to make the perfect vessel. Um, and so it's, it's humbling from that aspect. Um, but having said that, I agree with KK, the fact that um, the, the trial uh, may have had some, um, some uh, you know, uh, selection issues um, in terms of enrolling patients. I'm sure it was not an easy trial to do. Um, I, and also, um, uh, one big aspect of the the the, the non-significant uh, effect of PCI was probably due to 
uh, the huge, the enormous uh, improvements in medical therapy in the recent years, uh, especially in the heart failure uh, uh, you know, arena, uh, where we have so many different um, options nowadays and guideline-directed medical therapy uh, has improved um, you know, uh, outcomes so much uh, in, in that uh, uh, arena. So a lot of our heart failure patients are not the same patients that we saw 10 years ago or 15 years ago that we're seeing currently. Um, so I, I do agree that because the, the, the standard of treatment has gone up, uh, the additive value of additional treatment, uh, uh, the relative effect ha has gone down. I think it's similar with aspirin. You know, previously it was aspirin a day, you know, you know keeps coronary disease away or keeps MI away. Uh, but with, the, with statins, you know, you don't see the, the incremental benefit that you used to see uh, in the trials done way, way back, you, you would see the big benefit of aspirin. But nowadays, if you do a trial with patients all on statins, you don't see the benefit of, of, of aspirin. Uh, and so this is, an, uh, I think, will be an evolving topic. And, and I would really like to see the, the, the nitty gritty data from the trial. Uh, and because, uh, as KK mentioned, uh, you know, it, there's a big difference between having, uh, you know, multiple significant uh, perfusion defect in RCA territory or L or circumflex territory versus having a huge defect in an LAD territory uh, uh, and the patient has uh, low ejection fraction. I think that that may be a little slightly different uh, 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 animal. So uh, we will have to see the, the subgroup data from the trial. Uh, thanks, KW. Uh, I think the other uh, uh, question that we, we will need to ask ourselves is, um, you know, what about symptoms and where do patient preference come in? I think that is also different across the different uh, countries. Uh, and I should take uh, note that uh, at least in the various editorials that have sprung out in you know, various uh, online uh, newsletters that uh, for, for people are still um, holding their horses in terms of making uh, or in predicting whether there'll be guideline changes as a result of the revived study. I think this is nonetheless a very powerful study that helps inform us about uh, PCI and medical therapy in these cohorts of patients. So with that, uh, maybe I'll jump to uh, the Invictus trial, which was presented this morning. I didn't make it in time to hear it, so I dug it up from the New England. And briefly, uh, it's a randomized trial that looked at um, the role of uh, rivaroxaban at standard doses versus uh, conventional uh, warfarin um, at, uh, with iron of 2 to 3 in the treatment of patients with rheumatic uh, sorry, atrial fibrillation associated with rheumatic mitral stenosis with a uh, valve area of less than 2.0. And essentially in that study, um, and those of you who were present, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, the DOAC was inferior to warfarin uh, for the composite outcome. They had to change the composite outcomes because they were not accruing the same number of strokes as they predicted. Um, but essentially the composite outcome was uh, higher in the DOAC group and this included stroke, this included uh, death, um, and there was a separation of the curves beyond two years, especially, which was puzzling. Um, and there was no increased risk of bleeding in the warfarin group. So this was a very surprising study because I have so many patients with AFib that I wish I could send to a DOAC, you know, save my clinic space. But now with this trial, I can't. So Arintaya, I think... In, in Thailand and as is in Singapore, we still have a substantial number of patients with rheumatic atrial fibrillation. What is your take on this trial? Yes, um, for me, that's quite disappointing for me too because we have so many patients with rheumatic heart disease and AFib. And um, in this era with a generic DOAC, we wish that we can, we can uh, specify that to them and uh, we, can, we can monitor them less frequently. However, uh, for the, from the result of Invictus, I think probably that idea of less monitoring and less clinic visit might contribute to cardiovascular events, uh, which is higher in the in patient with uh, DOAC. Because if we have less monitoring or less frequent visit, the adherence may be not a quite uh, good monitor. And in this population, that patient in, with DOAC seem to have less medical adherence compared to warfarin. But if you have warfarin, you have more frequent uh, follow-up. And that may contribute to different, different or significant clinical difference uh, in outcome after two years. Because if it's uh, uh, because of the difference in stroke or embolism, it should be contributing in the first, 
but 2D, I mean. That is quite an interesting comment. So you are suggesting that, could it be that the need for INR titration creates an, an, uh, an encounter with the healthcare system that in of itself confers a protection? Is that what you're saying? Yes. We have uh, more face-to-face -face, uh, with the patients conversation, emphasize on the treatment and evaluation more frequently might contribute to that in my idea. AW, what do you think? So I, I wasn't able to catch the trial, so I, I'm not familiar with the data. Uh, but I think this is in line with the previous uh, observational studies that showed no benefit of, uh, of uh, um, DOAX and actually sh showed, uh, uh, in, you know, worse results with DOAX compared to warfarin. And that's why in the guidelines, uh, you still don't, uh, uh, you know, advocate for the DOAX uh, in terms of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation due to uh, valvular uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, so I think it's in line with the, the guidelines. However, uh, I, I don't know the details of the study, so I can't comment on the study itself. Uh, thanks, KW. Um, you know, the, and for those members uh, in the audience who have experience with rheumatic mitral stenosis, please uh, share your thoughts. Um, certainly for the Invictus study, one, one peculiar uh, effect was the separation of mortality at about two years. And I, I read the, uh, the discussion in the New England and there were some, um, a number of comments made, um, and again, you know, I, I, I think it is worthwhile digging a little bit into it, but one comment made was that there could be other effects that are not entirely represented by just the INR alone in warfarin, and they quoted another study, the WARF, WASF study, which had similar findings. And secondly, um, they attributed the uh, increased, uh, rather lower mortality beyond two years to patients having reached a stable INR state, uh, whereas at the beginning, there wasn't such, they needed some time to catch up. But again, that rounds counterintuitive that why would it only separate the two years and why not earlier, one year? So I think the jury remains out as to why there, were, um, there was this uh, effect seen uh, in these patients beyond two years. Um, I, I feel that uh, one thing which has troubled me is I do not understand why uh, atrial fibrillation um, in this setting, uh, you know, anticoagulation is not enough. And in the study, there were some other vascular causes of death that uh, was purported to explain this. I do not know whether any members of the audience have any insights into how this might affect your rheumatic uh, atrial fibrillation patients. Anybody with any thoughts on this, please uh, feel free to jump in. No? Any comments, KW? Yeah, it's a, it's a puzzling uh, area because uh, obviously uh, you get a more stable uh, anticoagulation effect with uh, uh, DOAX compared with warfarin. Uh, and that is the basis of the big benefit in the, you know, atrial fibrillation stroke prevention trials. Uh, you don't get the big jumping of the, you know, INR that you would get with, uh, uh, with the warfarin. Uh, and that resulted in, in less significant bleeding and that resulted in sometimes... Uh, a hard clinical benefit as well. Um, but for some reason, uh, for the, the mitral stenosis uh, related atrial fibrillation, we don't see that kind of benefit. Uh, and in fact, from, from what you told us, uh, you know, there's a, a you know, separation of the curves uh, in terms of mortality benefit for warfarin uh, after two years. So it's a very uh, difficult phenomenon to explain currently, I think. And the other thing which was uh, somewhat puzzling is, um... Um, oh no, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, is the lack of excess bleeding in the warfarin arm, uh, which uh, one would imagine would be superior in the in a DOAC group, uh, but there was there was no evidence of that. So I, I I'm also a bit uh, puzzled by that. Any thoughts on that? Uh? I'm not quite sure about the the mid age of the population because if you consider the study comparing warfarin and DOAC in population with like a acute pulmonary embolism, we can see that that's younger age compared to atrial fibrillation, and the bleeding is less in uh, in uh, low act group. And uh, I think that the age of population might 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 be contributing to uh, bleeding risk in warfarin and no act as well. So, so just to maybe wrap up the session, I want to maybe ask if for both of you, if you have uh, patients who con who who don't reach INR levels targets 
uh, as often as you like and who always appear to have difficulty controlling the RNA, would you consider switching to a DOAC given these results? Would you think it's reasonable? Very difficult question. <laughs> I think with this, if it's, uh, the, the patient has rheumatic mitral stenosis, I don't think that um, I will change it to DOAC. So, uh, probably more frequent IR monitoring and uh, home monitoring or, or the INR test. So maybe I prefer that way. Thanks, Arintaya. Yeah, I, I, I might have been keen to uh, maybe cheat and, and go to uh, DOAC uh, previously, but uh, after the results, I guess, uh, I will have to try harder to put uh, to make sure that the patients are on, on th uh, in the therapeutic range. Yeah, I think that this study was um, how do I put? It? I was disappointed because, as I said, I, I really wanted to have an opportunity to switch all my warfarin patients to a DOAC and save some space and uh, effort. Um, but I think, unfortunately, as the results show in this large study, um, the warfarin remains the drug of choice in atrial fibrillation patients who have rheumatic mitral stenosis. So I, I think we, we don't have any other comments and we would like to end this session. Uh, is anybody any comments to, uh, to add on? No? If not, uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you.